Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> we were looking uh, primarily at verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not a thing to be grasped after to be equal with God. Um, and we discussed that that word there. It's um, it speaks of trying to hold on to your rights or your what what is rightfully yours. <clears throat> All right. Well, you know that would seem correct, wouldn't it, to hold on to what is rightfully yours? I mean, doesn't that seem correct? I mean, shouldn't we all fight off everybody else? Just to hold on. Oh, sorry. Oh. <clears throat> um, okay, yes, it would be correct for humans or for, for mankind, for fallen mankind. But it's not the nature of God. And Jesus proves that. Jesus proves that, not in words and not in teaching, but he comes down and he lives it. He demonstrates truth and by demonstrating he is declaring that truth is not first in reality life is first and life will fulfill the truth in fact his life is the truth but our concept of truth is just that it's a concept it's a mental um embrace of certain thoughts instead of the truth being who lives and how it's lived. Christ lives and Christ lives in selflessness. Okay. And what I mean by that is we can talk about truth, that, that as truth uh, for us all day long, but unless the life of it, Christ lives it in us and through us, it's not going to happen. You, you see what I'm saying? Unless we, and there's a, you know, we have our part in that. I mean, we, we must let this mind, I mean, it says let. Let is a yielding word. It's not a grabbing word or go out and get it, baby, you know, that sort of deal. It's a, it's a yielding word. Let this mind be in you. There is a place that we function with the Lord. In this, you know, we can sit around and go, okay, Jesus, we'll just lay down your life, you know, and, and it don't happen because we're not letting his mind be in us. We're, we're saying Jesus is the life and he's a lamb and he lives in me, so go do it. Come on, I don't know why you're not doing it because I'm, I feel negative toward this. You have to let his mind be in you. You can resist that and, and that, you know, people... I'm sure those people don't understand me for a lot of different reasons. But one reason why I don't make a big deal out of them and just go, well, you people ought to have this mind, you know, that's it's in the Word of God. And he's, 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 you know, the apostle is telling you to let it be in you. But if he's telling you, he's telling you let it. In other words, you yield to that, not I'm telling you so you go do it, you know. Um, and... I know that the way the Lord began to reveal these things to me was, was, a, was not instantaneously upon salvation. And the Lord took me through a, a very chosen path, and he, he takes each one of us on, on the path that fits our life. <clears throat> and, uh, and nobody, no man, no preacher, no man, no Randy Nussbaum knows that path for you, you know. Um, all I know is the Jesus I've met, and all I know along with that is that the Holy Spirit and the, and the Father has put me in a position, whether it be teaching a few right here, right now, or many in, in Belgium or, you know, thousands in South America or whatever, it doesn't really matter that I let the Holy Spirit deliver this. 
not by excellency of speech, which I don't have, but in the power of the Spirit, which is not Holy Ghost power, it's the power of the Spirit to reveal Christ. First to us and then in us. To us and then in us. You know. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, so what we've been talking about here is this, <clears throat> this nature of the Lord that would not be grasping and therefore would willingly and, if you will, um, joyfully or certainly uh, of one spirit with the thing because it is his spirit to give. You see what I'm saying? Okay, the father says, okay, I want you to go down there and become a man and they're going to crucify you and it's going to be rough. And Jesus then go, Father, save me from this hour. Remember the scripture? He says, what shall I say then, Father, save me from this hour? He says, you know, but for this cause came I to this side. This is why I'm here. This. <laughs> you know, that's just powerful. I mean, and, it, and, it's, and it's, not, it's getting past scriptures, you know. It's getting past scriptures to, to hear what the, the heart of the Lord is saying in that thing. And you go, you know what? Maybe everything within me says, run, if I was in that situation. But I cannot go by me, my mind, my reactions. By, I, I renounce my mind and my reactions because I see, in, if nowhere else in that verse right there, but for, what shall I say, save me? But for this cause came I to this hour. And you see that save me thing is so Christian, but it's so not Christ. I'm serious. I mean, think of Jesus hanging on the cross. And, and uh, one of the thieves says, you know, well, if you're the son of God, save us. Well, he's still a thief. He's trying to get something he doesn't deserve, doesn't belong to him. You know, and the other one goes, look, we deserve this. <laughs> you know, he didn't do anything wrong, you know. And, and he never said, save us. And Jesus says, this day you'll be with me in paradise. If you seek to save, you're going to lose. If you lose for my sake. And of course it doesn't say, if you seek to save, you lose. But if you lose, you win. It doesn't say that. It says, if you lose for my sake. It, it is a thing of, of oneness. It is a thing of heart, of, of one mind. Of you know. And, and remember, that's what it says here in Philippians. I mean, it, to me, it's... It's really amazing, you know, how he's spelling this out. Same, you know, having the same love, being of one accord, one mind, um, in lowliness of mind, esteem other. It's all of this one mind thing. And the one mind is the mind of Christ. It is not, it is, folks, it is not a church getting together and saying, look, we're just going to be in one accord. Good luck with that. It doesn't work because people are too individualistic and too determined to get their rights and <clears throat> nobody's, nobody's manifesting Christ. They're manifesting self under the guise of Christianity. And again, I'm not condemning, I'm just saying, that's what, it, if it's not Christ, it's us, <laughs> you know. There's no condemnation in that, but it's pretty scary. <laughs> you know, it, it makes me want to know the Lord. I, and it makes me want him to decrease and me to decrease in a real way, in a real way, and not just say that. <clears throat> All right, so what we found is that Jesus is not a grasping person, that he's not, that he is um, selfless, in everything about him. But you know, when you start comparing Jesus with, let's say, Satan, you see a completely different thing at work. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 14. <clears throat> Isaiah 14 and verse 12. 
<clears throat> and we're just going to read a couple of verses here to start with. <clears throat> what we're going to do is we're going to read this in the thought of comparing what we hear here of that's at work in Satan with what we read in Philippians and what's at work in Jesus. Okay? All right. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground who didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. All right. So when we compare Jesus and Satan, we find out that Satan is a grasping person. You see it there? Uh, we'll, we'll get into it more so that you will. But, but here, here when he speaks, did you notice how many times he says, I? I will. I will do this. I will do that. Five times. I, 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 I. Okay. Once it becomes about you, then look out world. Because you'll run over other people to get what you want. Okay. And in and, and the verses after that, we, we find out that the degree of selfishness caused an infinite degree of destruction. Infinite. Based on what? Just somebody demanding their rights and it doesn't matter what about anybody else. I'll... I'll I'll send everybody to hell out. That's, you know, that's, that's the mind of the enemy. It's the mind of the fall. You know, Jesus said, you're of your father, the devil. And they said, no, we're not. We are of Abraham. Abraham is our father. And Jesus said, if, you, if Abraham were your father, you'd know me because he knew me. <laughs> you know. So, so don't give me that. And he says, you're of your father the devil because the works he does, you're doing. That's why I say that. You, you've been birthed out from him. All right. So, the, but when we read these verses, we realize that the substance of, of what he's trying to say here is that I am going to be like who? I'm going to be like God. Now, Jesus said that it's not something to be grasped after to be equal with God. That he didn't think that, that it was that. It was worth fighting over. <laughs> but we see here, I, verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. All right. Now, I have done... Um, extensive study on God being called the most high and I'm going to tell you my opinion um, from what I have found I'm not going to go into all of it here but I have I have covered it in other sharings and that is that the most high is the lamb on the throne <laughs> it's the self-giving one who is exalted for it and but, but Satan hears the name Most High, or Lucifer, hears the name Most High, and he equates that with all the trappings of, of godness. It's me. <laughs> like I said, I'm nobody. I'm an ignorant savage, but by the grace of God. All right. So... Um, so here you get a spirit. I will, I will, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. And so equality with God was driving him. All right. Well, that's admirable. He wants to be like God. 
you know. I mean, you remember the first sin that caused the fall of the whole race. You can be like God, eat this. And I saw that it was good looking and good to the taste and able to make one wise. Everything that's good and above what you are now. Paul said, whatever state you find yourself there and be content. Well, if I was in a good state, I would. You know, so I don't want to hear anybody griping about being here in Texas. Because he said, whatever state you're in. <clears throat> That's the word of God. <laughs> so, um, you know, you just hear this anxiousness in these words, don't you? In, in, in Isaiah 14 here, there's an anxiousness. I, it's like a determination, but it's a dissatisfaction that I don't have it yet. And it's like, and, and you know, I mean, he could have said, well, I, I will be the, the monster of, you know, Mesopotamia or something, you know. And he says, but he says, I will be like the Most High God. Well, do you know there's a lot of people that, that can wrap themselves in that cloak? And, and most Christians that go, oh, oh, well, praise God. You're seeking the Lord, <laughs> you know. And it's, you know, he doesn't come, you know, with a red tail and a pitchfork. The Bible says that he comes as an angel of light. So if he comes as an angel of light, an angel of light, and he says, I'm seeking, to, I'm seeking God. Is it possible that we could fall for that? <clears throat> All right. So when the scriptures talk about discerning the spirits, it's not talking about like having some sort of wishbone thing and you're walking around going, you know, oh, there's one and, you know, or whatever. It's not, it, it's not like you're just trying to figure out the demons is, is that really what God's about look just figure out the demons I mean discern the spirits just spend your time you know figuring out demons <laughs> well okay I believe that there is a truth in that where you can discern um, something not of God in somebody <clears throat> but I believe the clearest ring of that bell is when you can discern their spirit by I will or I will lay down my life. Because everybody can look good under all the right circumstances, but wait till things turn bad. And that's when you find out the, the graspers and the, and the demanders of their rights and everything because that thing rises up and it wants its way and it's going gonna, it's gonna to do whatever it has to do to get its way and, and all that stuff. <clears throat> you know, when everything is nice and gentle and everything, the truth is that's not even the best time to try to discern somebody's spirit or, or as it were, what spirit they are of. And let's face it, in one sense, there's really only two. There's either Adam or Christ, there's either this spirit we're talking about here, or those who are of their, fa their heavenly father. Okay. <clears throat> um, and I know that, you know, I know there's a lot of, you know, my, my class, my, this, my purpose is not in this class to teach demonology and deliverance. Okay. Uh, we do have a class on it, so, so we're not discounting any of that. Do you all understand what I'm saying here? We're not discounting that. We're not saying that's invalid. Somebody says, y'all don't believe in healing. Pfft. I mean, I know a doctor did some work on me, but I know my daddy also did some work on me, and I'm just blessed. <clears throat> um, but, it, you know, because we believe all that stuff doesn't put that above Jesus to us and never will. You know, and people can hate us for that. Well, you don't believe in demons then. Well, 
you know, if you put it like that, I guess I don't. <laughs> I mean, I know they're there, but I certainly don't believe in them, you know. <laughs> so, you know, there's uh, sometimes you, you can paint yourself into a corner if someone's not getting what the specific thing that you're saying um, and then assume certain things about you. But really, all I'm trying to show here is this, and I'm using these scriptures to do it, the contrast of Isaiah 14 with Philippians, and you find two completely different spirits. Completely different. And so, Satan thought being equal with God was something to seize, something to grasp after, something to fight for, something to, you know, get all panicky about if he doesn't have. Jesus didn't. But why did Jesus not feel that? What was the reason? It wasn't in his nature. It's not in his nature to do that. See, God is love, and this is love, and love is self-giving. Greater love than this. Well, you know. It always refers to that. By this perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life. You know, it's just, that's just it. That's his spirit. That's who he is. God is, if God is love, then God is, this is his essence. And it's, and it's seen in this kind of a light. <clears throat> so, um, I wrote down a little note here. Which God did Satan want to be like? Because I thought that was important. I thought that was important. Uh, who was the God that Satan sought to be like? It was, he wanted to be like the blessed one, the exalted one, the powerful one. We'll look at those scriptures here in just, just a moment. But Jesus gave up all that. That's our Jesus. That's our Jesus. That's my Jesus. And that affects me. Because it's not just Jesus, and it's not just a Jesus, or it's not just the Lord Jesus so far away. It's my Jesus. And that affects me. He gave up all that. He did it gladly. Hallelujah. To him be all the glory. So, the, the Lord didn't consider being like God in that particular way as worth fighting for. Now, he thought being like God in the way the nature of God is, of selflessness, he maintained that, didn't he? But he didn't, he didn't carry with him all the trappings that would identify him as God. You know. I mean, I always think of people say, well, you know, I, I remember years and years ago. I guess I was still in Bible school. And somebody said, well, all the miracles prove he is the son of God. And I said, you know, it doesn't. He said, I didn't do those. That's my father in me did the works. Do you remember that? I mean, he said that. It proves his father is God. <laughs> but he wasn't trying to do those as God. You say, well, then how did he do them? Well, he did it, he did it by God again. He didn't do it. You know, example I always use is what is it, John 5, where they accuse him of, you know, they say, well, you know, you, they finally found the accusation. Well, you heal this lame man on the Sabbath. And that's not the one where Jesus said, well, you know, I'm Lord of the Sabbath or whatever. That's not the one. It's, it's where he said back to him, I didn't do that. My father did it. <laughs> Don't blame me. I didn't do that. That was my father. <clears throat> well, I love that because that's the way we ought to be when we walk as man. You understand what I mean? With God, you know, with Christ in him. 
But it's, I didn't do that. That was Jesus. You know? It's not even the way I am. Thank God he's my life. Because it would be, it would have turned out really ugly if it had been me. <laughs> All right. So, um, in verse 13 here, it says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Okay, so he's going to be like God. What God? The one who ascends into heaven. All right, well, remember Philippians 2? Anybody remember Philippians 2 where, where it uses the word wherefore? Because he lived by kenosis, he, he became a man. As a man, he became a servant. As a servant, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <clears throat> All right, so Jesus ascended. We'll get into this uh, later at a later date, but he, he wasn't just resurrected. He ascended. Um, well, I've got a couple of scriptures eventually here we'll get into, hopefully tonight. It'll help on that. And he wanted to have a throne, but he wanted to be exalted on the throne. He wanted to be exalted on the throne. Now, Jesus was raised up and, and seated at the right hand of God. Amen? But Jesus never raised himself up. And I'm telling you, that's an important point. And it'll, we'll get into that, too, as we go. But that's so important. That, that, because guess who's raising themselves up here in Isaiah 14? And he's trying to ascend, and he's trying to get a throne, and he's doing all this stuff. And so he wants to sit in power and glory over and above the congregation. It sounds like some pastors I've heard of. No, just kidding. Actually, it does, but <clears throat> but I don't want to center on that. And then keep your place here, but um, turn with me over to, to Psalm 48. Hope this is the right one. I'm pretty sure it is. <clears throat> Psalm 48. <clears throat> you know, I can tell that Caitlin is conforming more and more to Texas because like a gunfighter with two guns on their hips, she's got two Bibles sitting there ready to pull them out. <laughs> Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, uh, Psalm 48, verse 1. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Sides of the north, did you notice that back in, back in Isaiah? He wants to sit in the sides of the north. He wants to sit as a great king. That's all he saw from that. That's all he got out of it. Folks, if you look with your eyes and you go by the natural mind, you're going to be deceived because you are going to tend toward this kind of thinking. And you're going to see things and you go, oh, I want that. I want to I want to sit on a throne. I want this, you know, because that's the way we are, unless it's Christ, unless Christ begins to be formed in us. <clears throat> and if Christ isn't formed in us, thank God we got the Holy Spirit who can still correct us. It doesn't change us yet. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? The Holy Spirit is a faithful guide, and he will go, ah. <laughs> and you go, well, but I want to. And he'll say, no. <laughs> and you'll say, yes, Lord. <clears throat> All right, verse uh, 14. I will, ascend all, uh, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. <clears throat> so here we have him ascending above again and into the heights. Okay. See, nobody wants to get low. But Paul says, with lowliness of mind. With lowliness. Nobody wants to be, nobody in their natural mind would. You know, you say, what are you? In your natural mind, you wouldn't want to do that. It's true. You wouldn't want to do that. In your natural mind, you want to be something great for God. I did. I mean, I really had a big plan for greatness for God. I only wanted it for God. You know, I'm glad it worked out. <clears throat> To take the lower seat is a privilege, not something you do because everybody else is self-centered and grabbed all the higher seats. It's a privilege. How do you explain that? I can't. I can only tell you it's Christ. I cannot explain it. I can only tell you that to see that lower seat, even before anybody has taken any of the seats, you can head for it and go, I am happy to be here, you know. And then if God or the, or the master of the house has come up here, you do it in obedience to him not to fulfill your soulless desire to be somebody. You do it because he called you up there. You don't go, I knew I was something special. I, oh, I didn't take these people so long to acknowledge and to see me for what I am. Oh, we're seeing you for what you are. <clears throat> oh, we get it. You can tell by the way they sit down once they've been called up. You know, it's like. <laughs> it's pretty pitiful. <laughs> <clears throat> well, it's almost ridiculous to ask anybody to take the lower seat if they don't have that spirit. Because if they do it, it's not going to be pretty on the inside. You know, they might sit there and go, look, I took the lower seat. Pride, pride, even, you know what I mean. They're, they're proud over their humility. <laughs> it's, it's, it's right. <laughs> you know, and, and just, you know, so I'm so glad to be here, but they're not. They're so glad that they're humble and none of these people are. You know, <clears throat> you know, it's, all, it's just all wrong. It's, it's almost, this is, and the, this is Randy, this is my thinking. It's almost better not, and for me, I mean, I think everybody else thinks differently and good men, great, and better men than me, better ministers than me. But I just think, man, it's almost useless to even teach this until people can even get to a point of realizing that it has to be Christ and then wanting Christ. And then once he's formed, then he begins to perform those things. And then all glory goes to him. And I, and I, and I'll, I'll tell you why I say that, because I'm a true pastor. I mean, I'm called of God to be a pastor. And when I see people struggling with this, when it should be a joy, I don't think, again, I don't think of the problem, I think of the lack, you know, and I just want to put what's lacking or help or facilitate or pray or whatever to get that in them. But it, because they're God's sheep, it breaks my heart that they would go through any of that stuff. I just want them to know the Lord, and it, sometimes it kills me, and yet people think, well, well, you teach the word so you know, firmly or whatever, I don't know, with authority or what, I don't, I don't know. You know, I've been told this and that, and you teach it, and therefore, you know, I, I feel a, a, an expectation that I need to act this way when I'm 
in and around the church. You know what I've told people who've said that who didn't have that spirit? I said, go out, go to the bar and just get drunk. Yeah. I know people, I know y'all are worried about me. You think I'm going to really get in trouble with the Lord over that. You know, I just say, get out, hey, let's go bust hell wide open. You know, and maybe you'll come to an end of yourself like the prodigal son and come back to the father's house and go, you know what, this is the... See, I say this stuff so that you know you better get a hold of Jesus because there's no hope with me. <laughs> All right, so... Um, he wants to be high and lofty. He wants to have a. He he doesn't just want to be high and lofty. He wants a position. A position. A position. All right. Let's see. Yeah, keep your place here, but uh, you got to see this one. Ephesians chapter four. I really like this one. I like it all, but, you know, the Holy Spirit is sometimes just fun, the way he deals with me. Ephesians 4. And uh, <clears throat> verse 7, or beginning of verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Okay, is that plain enough? That grace is according to the measure of Christ. It's not, he doesn't just give grace. He gives it according to the measure of the gift of Christ. But that's not the verse I was looking for. Verse 8, wherefore he saith, whom, uh, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Okay, so here we go. The devil looks at that and he goes, yeah, I know, I've seen it. I've seen Jesus sitting on that throne before he ever became a man. I saw how the Father, you know, loved him. And I saw how all the angels, and not just the angels, the cherubim and the seraphim and, the, you know, all, those, all the films bowed down before him and honored him and loved him. And, you know, and I want to ascend above the heights of the clouds. I want to sit on a throne in the sides of the north. I, I want that kind of deal. So he looks at this and he goes, yeah, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. I mean, look how great that looks. And so, so the writer or the Holy Spirit chooses to work through the writer and go, okay, we need to temper this right now. So then, <clears throat> uh, verse 9, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. So here it is. Here it is. There is no ascension. There is no resurrection without death. There is not. There is not. Not on any level. Not spirit, soul, or body. There's, there is not going to be that. And so <clears throat> it's... So Satan is looking at Jesus and looking at his glory and looking at all this stuff. And he goes, well, he's, you know, he gets all that because he's the son of God. And, you know, I don't even know all the wormy little thoughts that come, you know, in his brain. But, but uh, so Jesus, Jesus now sits on the throne, according to Philippians 2, 8 through 10. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name. But now it's on a different basis. He's not sitting at the right hand because he's the son of God. He is the son of God sitting at the right hand of God. But he's not sitting there because he's the son of God. He's sitting there because he first descended. Because, because he first went down into death. Because he first went down, you can, you know, wherever you want to take that. He went down into Hades and, you know, preach to the prisoners or whatever. It's, it's down. He first descended. 
because there is now in this economy of God, not, we're not talking about financial economy, we're talking about the way God operates when we say the economy of God, the, the way that he has it set up and the way he functions with it and in it and through it <clears throat> is now based on the lamb, is now based on selfless giving, is now based on getting low. And then he'll exalt you. <clears throat> Gosh. Let me see. Gosh, there's such good stuff here. I'm afraid I'm not going to get all that done. <clears throat> all right. So let's go back. I hope you kept your place there in Isaiah 14. <laughs> not, there it is. All right, so we see here, uh, and you know, if you, if you compare this, and I didn't because I don't even have time to deal with this, but if you compare this with Ezekiel 28, you see that he was the anointed cherub, the cherub that covereth, you know, and it goes on and gets into all of that stuff, meaning that he was of a high position already, but it wasn't good enough for him. But, you know, it's like, no, I got to be more seen. I got to have a higher position. I got to be praised. I got to be all this junk. All right. <clears throat> so, um, but then this is talking about his fall after we get into this. Um, so let's look at uh, verse 12. Let's say I'm not 12, verse uh, 15 through 17. Yet thou shalt be brought down to Sheol, to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man who made the earth to tremble, who did shake kingdoms? who made the world like a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who opened not the house of his prisoners. <clears throat> All right, so what brings about someone's fall? What did I just ask? What brings about someone's fall? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, let's... let's uh, Let's look at verse 12 again. The first few words. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground who didst weaken the nation? How, how have you fallen, Lucifer, son of the morning? When I was a missionary in Jamaica, would walk to church couple of times a week and on my way there there was a Rastafarian who had a little hut and he sold stuff we were way off in the bush way away from the big cities and stuff like that if you know anything about Rastafarians they're <clears throat> pretty wild and uh, every every time I'd pass by he'd look at me and he'd say Lucifer son of the morning and I'd look back at him and smile I'd say Jesus loves you and I'd walk on <laughs> <laughs> Um, son of the morning, how art thou fallen? All right. Well, we can now. Okay, we can we can real quick think. Okay, um, you know specifics. You're fallen because of your pride, or you're fallen because of this or that. But you know the scriptures give it to us right here. Now, I, you know. It says it in so many words of what you said, but it says it plainly just as what it is. Um, <clears throat> How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Now drop down to verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart. Yeah, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will, I will, I will. How are you fallen? Because you said all the things where you planned for your exaltation. For you to be something. For you to be honored. For you to have a reputation. For you to, everything Jesus gave up. That's what he did. You know, 
I just got a wonderful part to get into next as to how this applies the way Jesus, when he walked the earth, the way he, he imparted these realities. But I've got so many scriptures, and we need, to be, we need to see Jesus talking now. You know, we need to hear him. And we need to really not just know principles. We need to hear Jesus talking to us as his disciples and find out where he's coming from on all of this. Um, so I'm not going to continue. It's almost time to quit anyway, but I'm not going to continue. Um, and I will mark this, because if I don't, I'll forget. Um, but next time we're, gonna, we're going to look at this from the New Testament view and then and then after we see that and we see it, we hear it from his mouth, then we will go back to Isaiah 14 and we'll see the fulfillment. Okay? Father, we thank you for your spirit, our true teacher, our true guide, the one that truly lifts up Christ as, as no man ever could and as no who hath known the spirit of, the, of God, but his spirit. So I acknowledge that I'm nothing, nor are my words, nor do I know anything yet as I ought. But I know that you said the Holy Spirit is here, and he is our guide, and he will always faithfully lift up Jesus and show him in ways that I never could. So we, we call upon you. We don't just do an ending prayer for a a class we call upon you from our hearts and we ask you release the holy spirit to to show these things in light of life and in light of who you are and who you are meant to be in us and move us out of religion and move us out of principles and move us out of just bare scriptures into your very view into your attitudes, your mind in us. We ask you to do that for Jesus' glory. We ask it in his name. Amen. All right, we're dismissed.